Let's take a look at a simple model that deals with the core factors that are necessary to conduct a modern war between states. Let's start with the obvious. To fight a war you need armed forces. Those armed forces are recruited from your manpower and equipped by your industry. The industry itself is dependent on a continuous flow of resources to produce weapons, equipment and supplies for your troops. But there's one component which I haven't talked at all so far in my videos. The willingness to fight which is a combination of political and popular support. Now this is a rather simple model, so let's take a look how it holds up in World War II. Let's look at Germany, Poland, France, the Soviet Union and the United States. In both Germany and Japan's case, the armed forces, industry and resources had to be mostly crushed before the willingness to fight was sufficiently broken to force a surrender. For Germany it was necessary to capture the capital Berlin. For Poland the situation was a bit different. Although the Polish forces were crushed and the country occupied by Germany and the Soviet Union, a significant part of Polish soldiers fled to allied countries and continued to fight from there. Also there was no collaboration with the Germans on the political nor economic level. Poland in World War II is probably the strongest case that shows that the mere willingness to fight can be sufficient to continue a war although not a classic symmetric war, but more on this later. For France, the situation was quite different. After a large part of the French army was encircled, the French under new leader surrendered, while significant parts of the industry, resources and also armed forces, especially the navy, were still operational. But the willingness to fight of a large part of the population and the French leadership was low. Of course, there were the free French and later on the resistance that continued to fight but in 1940 they were in a minority. This is in contrast to the Soviet Union, which also suffered huge losses in the early stages of the war against the Wehrmacht. But the Soviets didn't surrender. Of course, the German policies had quite an impact on the willingness of the Soviet people to fight on. Also, despite the huge losses, the Soviet Union managed to evacuate a significant amount of industry and its resources were mainly out of reach of the Germans. For the United States the situation is a bit more diverse. On the political level the willingness to fight was strong with the Roosevelt administration, whereas the population and Congress were quite reserved. This would change dramatically after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the subsequent German declaration of war against the United States. Let's stay with the United States, but let's look at the more recent war, the Vietnam War. In this case the United States had still strong industry, resources, a large amount of armed forces, yet a limited willingness to fight ultimately led to its defeat. Although the North Vietnamese Tet Offensive was a military failure, it was a political victory. It shifted the public opinion of the United States and is described by some as the psychological turning point in the Vietnam War. It led the US to gradually leave South Vietnam on its own and thus in a sense lose the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War is probably the best known example that illustrates the best armed forces backed by the strongest industry can be defeated if the willingness to fight is not sufficient. So far we mainly looked at symmetrical conflicts. Although the Vietnam War was to a certain degree a guerrilla war against the Viet Cong, but it also had quite many components of a symmetrical war. For instance, the North Vietnamese anti-aircraft capabilities. Now, one way to classify wars is based on a symmetry of capabilities. A typically symmetrical war was World War II on the Western Front. Both Germany and the Allies were fighting on mostly even terms with regular armies and industries. During the Vietnam War there was a mixture. The North Vietnamese army fought to a certain degree a symmetrical war, whereas the Viet Cong fought mostly a guerrilla war. In case of the armed conflict during the Cuban Revolution it was mostly a classical guerrilla warfare. Now the strongest form of asymmetric war is terrorism. Usually a small group of people with very limited capabilities try to fight a large force or state. Which brings us to the next distinction. Symmetric warfare and asymmetric warfare are not only distinguished by the capabilities, but also by the distinction between combatants and non-combatants. For instance, terrorists often target civilians. In guerrilla war there is also often a cooperation between the guerrilla forces and civilians. Similarly, those that fight terrorists or guerrillas have a hard time distinguishing who the enemy is and who isn't. Now this brings us to another aspect. What about wars that are based almost exclusively on the willingness to fight because they lack an industry and a regular force?
Let's look at the Cuban Revolution. Because initially Fidel Castro landed with a handful of his men in Cuba and was almost wiped out in the first engagement. The rebels under Castro had only a small amount of troops, no industry, nor resources, thus only the willingness to fight. Yet over time, they managed to recruit new troops and to a certain degree construct a limited support infrastructure and later on capture more, which allowed them to a degree to wage war at a symmetrical level in the later stages. Although it should be mentioned that the war in Cuba was relatively easy to win for the rebels due to the extreme corruption of the regime and its ineptness to fight the rebels. Yet the Cuban Revolution and the Vietnam War seem to indicate that without proper willingness to fight, the best troops, industry and resources can't win against a determined enemy. This also makes clear that this model makes only sense if one takes always into account the enemy, because all those values are relative and especially the willingness to fight is highly dependent on the situation. After all, it's a psychological criterion that it doesn't need to conform to numbers, rationality or sound analysis as the result of the Tet Offensive clearly shows. Thus the willingness to fight must always be seen in relation to the enemy or better the perceived enemy. One can just imagine how different the alliances and collaborations of World War II would have been if the British and thus subsequently the United States would have stayed neutral in 1940, because for many communism was a greater threat than fascism. Please let me know what you think of this model. I think it's also suitable for earlier conflicts, although I might have missed something. Additionally, maybe I have just selected wars that fit.